quiet. His divine immortality has consented to favor us with a new poem. Speak. Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. <laughs> Scholars, welcome back to another episode of Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger. I'm a professional artist and a master educator attempting to provide you with the best in our historical content. Follow along for more. Oh, please, Jim. Please, please, Jim. Please, please, please. Today, I'm at the Des Moines Art Center here in Des Moines, Iowa. We're going to go inside, take a look at their permanent collection, and check it out. Let's go in where that guy's coming out. The Des Moines Art Center is a modern, contemporary type gallery space that's a great place in the hub of Des Moines, Iowa. First and foremost, I gotta recommend the location. Check it out. There's tons of great work there. Highly recommend it. Anyway, I'm going to look at 11 different artworks in this, which is going to be part one because there's just too much stuff. I gotta divide it into two parts. So this is part one, 11 great works of art at the Des Moines Art Center that really caught my eye on this visit. So let's start number one. We're going to go chronologically through time, looking at this work by Emil Bernard, Still Life with Fruit, Cup, and Pitcher from 1888. What a great example. Now Bernard as an artist is a French post-impressionist painter who is known to have had friendships with artists such as Gauguin, Van Gogh, and Cezanne. Much of his fine artwork was done in his earlier career, where later in life, he focused on plays, poetry, and art criticism. Now, it seems like we're going backwards a little bit, but we're going to go from post-impressionism to impressionism. A great impressionist master, Pierre-Auguste Renoir, in this fantastic little painting, Passage Landscape from 1906. Now this is a work by one of the forefront masters and leaders of Impressionism, again Pierre-Auguste Renoir. Now by this time in his life he had already had debilitating rheumatoid arthritis that had really crippled his hands and his ability to paint and so we see him painting in a slightly different style in this work. A little bit more painterly, a little less detailed, but what a fantastic example of his work and the work that he was doing at this time near the end of his artistic career and life. Not me. I'm in my prime. Henry O. Tanner was the first African-American painter to become internationally acclaimed. As a matter of fact, he would study in the United States as well as in France and have international acclaim and artistic clout, with his artwork being placed in the greatest of gallery spaces, including the Musée d'Orsay and, of course, the Des Moines Art Center. This particular work, Christ Learning to Read from 1911, was inspired after he took a trip with his family to Morocco. The light and the colors and those sorts of elements really inspired him when creating this great painting, including his wife and son, who strangely enough were both named Jesse, but I digress. They were just asking about the family. This is a photograph that was taken by James Van Der Zee, one of the premier photographers during the Harlem Renaissance. He would take photographs of all kinds of famous subjects, but in this one, Billy from 1926 is of the famed singer Billy Holiday, who was known as an American jazz and swing singer, obviously of that same time period. Side note, now I do have a video specifically on James Van Der Zee and several of these other artists, so check out the library of my other videos and you'll never know what you stumble across. Now as we walk around through the Des Moines Art Center, we're going to see all kinds of great things including this, one of my absolute favorites by Edward Hopper, the American realist painter and printmaker who is mostly known for his urban isolation type scenes, interesting work. In this specific work called Automat from 1927. Now, Automat is a unique piece because before Nighthawks, before his other works that illustrate the loneliness of urban life, he would create Automat. Automat was his first realistic urban type scene that he created in his career and it really set forth the trend that he would go forward with. I'll talk more about this one later on, but let's take a look at another work. 
This is the Wind Orchestra from 1945 by the Jewish-American painter Max Weber. As time would go on, he would work in more and more Jewish-type themes. However, this one is purely musical, and I absolutely love it. And of course, artists do evolve, and Weber would evolve into a cubist. But in the meantime, in 1945, at the middle end of World War II, Weber was making these great paintings, and this one, in my mind, couldn't be any more fun. His use of color and line just pop. The shapes that he creates are absolutely fantastic. I'll never forget that look. Mark Rothko's Light Over Gray from 1956 is a wonderful piece in the Des Moines Art Center collection. Rothko would approach painting with this very color field type mentality, meaning that he would create these big, bold blocks of color and placing them in juxtaposition to one another. And this one is absolutely spot on. I absolutely love this work. And it doesn't get any more quintessential Rothko than this very work. Speaking of abstraction, now we go on to Louise Nevelson, an American sculptor who is known for her abstracted sculptural works, just like Black Chord 7 from 1965. This is all made out of wood that is painted black, and as the light and the environment changes a little bit, so does the work. Strangely enough, I think that's the absolute power of abstracted pieces just like this one by Louise Nevelson where you can look at it at different times of the day in different lights in different environments in different areas of the gallery and everywhere at every time it's going to look a little bit different. Roy Lichtenstein is a pop artist that did absolutely wild things during his career and one of those really great paintings that he did in 1969 is the Great Pyramid. Now Lichtenstein is probably more well known for his works that show comic book type scenes and things like that, but this one utilizes those same sort of techniques but illustrating the Great Pyramid, obviously. So later on in his career, he would do reproductions of masters like Cezanne, Mondrian, Picasso, and others. And this is kind of in that same sort of series where he's exploring the artworks of others, clearly the ancient Egyptians. And directly across the way from the Liechtenstein is this huge painting by Saul the Wit. Wall painting number 601, forms derived from a cube, 25 variations from 1989. Now, Saul LeWitt is a conceptual artist, meaning that his ideas are more important than the actual product. And in this case, the work began by a concept in 1968 where he constructed a series of elaborate instructions that were then sent to the Des Moines Art Center where a team of six artists would actually create it. Three artists were brought in from New York and three local artists from Des Moines were also involved in creating this painting. Saul LeWitt himself had absolutely nothing to do with the actual painting, but it was his design that the entire plan was based off of. It's an interesting way of approaching art, it's an interesting way of thinking about art, instead of it being about the artist makes the work, but instead the artist makes the plan. Kind of like an architect, but a little more painterly. Ah, oh, jeez, mine doesn't look anything like his. We move here to see this video artwork by Bill Viola, an American video artist who learned from Nam June Paik and has gone on to fuse Eastern and Western ideas and works and videos just like this one, Ascension, from the year 2000. And this 10 minute long video, for me personally, is a little bit hard to watch. You see, my father died in a drowning, and so this brings up all kinds of psychological and emotional reactions that really makes it difficult for me to watch, but as a work of art, I very much appreciate the work, and I appreciate Bill Viola as an artist. And generally speaking, I appreciate all of the artists that have their artwork at the Des Moines Art Center. What a great venue, 
and a place to view art. Fantastic collection. I highly recommend it. And again, this collection is so vast and so great, I had to break this video up into two sections. So I've got two videos on the Des Moines Art Center that each have 11 works. So total of 22, but diced it up into two segments. At any rate, I appreciate you coming along on this ride. And if you like this video, make sure you like, share, subscribe, comment, and do all those great things that I know you're going to do to interact with this video and all of the videos that I have in my archive. Thanks again for watching, and we'll catch you next time. See, I thought it was really cool. Yeah, so I must be really a dipshit.